welcome to this week's edition of Film Shocks with Hitchcock, my year-long journey with the Master of Suspense. And today we have what should be Hitchcock's ninth fully produced feature-length film. And it also just happens that today's film, The Manx Man, is the last fully silent movie from Hitchcock's filmography. After this, he would produce Blackmail, which was released as both a silent film and a sound film. I want to add some notes from previous episodes, because I've been following Hitchcock's filmography on Letterboxd, and I noticed something happened. Easy Virtue suddenly has a new release year. It's been released now in 1926, according to Letterboxd, so that makes it released immediately after The Pleasure Garden. From my understanding, this is completely incorrect. I don't know where that change happened, but again, it, there's so many conflicting reports about when some of these films were released. Some of the films are going off of the premiere date. Some of them are going off of the general release date. Some of these films were produced way before they actually got a general release. And Easy Virtue is one that I'm pretty sure, even according to the Truffaut book, was released in 1928. It was released right before Champagne was produced. So I'm going to follow that since those were actual interviews that Hitchcock did with Truffaut. He doesn't correct him when Truffaut says that that was the next movie. So why Letterboxd suddenly changed it to 1926, I don't know where they got that year at all. But anyway, we're going to talk about The Manx Man, released in 1929. We were headed towards the end of the silent era, which really did go away quite quickly. And after sound was introduced in film with the Jazz Singer in 1927, very quickly studios uh, wanted to transfer everything to sound. Theaters were installing sound systems. Silent actors began to lose work. And by the year 1930, silent films had completely been phased out. It was one of the quickest transitions in film history. But as Hitchcock proved, his silent films did slowly improve over time, even if some of them are still a bit longer than they should be, some of the shots linger for way too long, and The Manx Man is no different. This movie clocks in at 100 minutes. At least that's the version I watched. I watched the restored version that BFI did for the Hitchcock 9 in 2012. It was released by Kino through an Alfred Hitchcock Blu-ray collection. However, for the most part, a lot of people can watch this movie on multiple bootleg DVDs and other copies that are out there, usually at a runtime of 83 minutes. And The Manx Man is one of the best-looking Hitchcock films from the silent era. It has a beautiful transfer. The film reel was in pristine condition, and it really looks like it was almost shot yesterday, especially when we do some of the close-ups, and we can actually read the lips of the actors. In fact, sometimes that's necessary for the film's story. The Manx Man is based on a novel by Sir Hall Kane. The novel was adapted for the stage before being adapted into film in 1916 by director George Lone Tucker. However, this version of the film is lost, even though it was a critical and commercial success. In 1929, Hitchcock made a new adaptation of the film. Since the book takes place in the Isle of Man, which is an island between Ireland and the UK, he actually shot the film there. But it sounds like halfway through they relocated production because the writer of the book himself, Sir Hall Kane, lived on the island and apparently interfered with the production one too many times. It was getting on Hitchcock's nerves. Uh, this is according to a book by Vivian Allen from 1997. That's the only source that I can find about that story, but the idea that Hitchcock was trying to make an adaptation on this author's work while the author was there trying to manipulate things into his own vision is kind of funny, especially for someone who's an auteur like Hitchcock. But anyway, let's get into the story. It opens with ships on the ocean, and we meet Pete, a fisherman who's played by Carl Brisson. You might recognize Carl Brisson as one round Jack in the ring. He's best friends with Philip, who's a businessman, who's played by Malcolm Keane, who actually played Joe in The Lodger. Philip and Pete are best friends, and they work together utilizing each other's strengths. Pete and all the other fishermen are supported by Philip. Philip uses his power as a businessman to protect the interests of the fishermen, sort of developing a union of some sort with them. Philip and Pete's relationship goes back many years, and it's a sweet relationship given that they're on two different levels of class. 
However, there's a girl named Kate who Pete has an absolute affection for. Philip, on the other hand, also has a liking to her, but he doesn't reveal this too quickly. He lets Pete make his move without getting in the way. However, Kate's father believes Pete is poor, has no money, is just a fisherman, and he needs to prove himself before he ends up with Kate. So Pete decides he's going to go to Africa to make some money. When he travels to Africa, he tells Philip to take care of Kate while he's gone. While he's gone, Kate and Philip actually develop a bit of a relationship, and a letter is sent to them confirming that Pete, in fact, died in Africa. So they decide... Well, since Pete's gone, I don't need to wait for him anymore. We should just be together ourselves. However, you find out Pete is, in fact, alive. He's lying about his death, and he hopes to come back home and surprise everyone with his new fortune. Which is pretty emotionally manipulative. Like, you're really going to tell everyone that you're dead, including this woman that you fancy, and you just think it's a good idea to show up and be like, no, I'm actually alive. And, I mean, if she questions you about it, is she going to question why they thought you were dead? Are you going to tell her, oh, that was me, I made the fake report? Because I wanted to make a grand return, a great entrance, to shock everybody. It really sums up how dumb of a guy Pete is. Pete returns home, surprises everyone, proposes to Kate, and now the father accepts him. And unfortunately, that means that Philip needs to get out of the way, because he made a promise to Pete. In fact, he ends up being Pete's best man at the wedding, which Kate very reluctantly agrees to. They have a somewhat depressing relationship. Pete is pretty oblivious to all the sadness that Kate's experiencing, and at one point, she's pregnant with a child. We find out later, though, that this child is, in fact, not Pete's, but it's Philip. So there's a whole lot of tension going on, and there's a bit of a love triangle, which is similar to the other film that Carl Prisson was in, The Ring. I have to say, though, that this love triangle is pretty effective because you don't really know where things are going to end up. You understand where everybody's coming from. Even though Pete is pretty forceful about the whole marriage, I don't think he takes into account Kate's opinion about him, about the marriage. I think he just assumes that, of course you'd want this, because you're a woman, and it's the 20s. Why wouldn't you want to marry me now that I have money? But he's also such a sweet guy that you kind of feel bad for him. He's a bit of a pathetic person. Kate, on the other hand, just feels that she can't say anything and stop him, even though she's in love with Philip. Now, as to why Philip couldn't say anything himself, I guess it's just out of fear, because he had made a promise to Pete, and even after he thought he was dead, he didn't immediately propose to Kate and start a relationship up. He was still feeling a little weary about the whole thing, even though Kate was a lot quicker to jump on a romance. So there's an understandable conflict between them all, and for the most part, Pete's oblivious. It's not until Kate attempts suicide and is put on trial that everything is revealed. As a successful businessman, and with all the support of the fishermen, Philip becomes the Deemster. I looked up the term Deemster, and it just means that's a judge in the Isle of Man. As Deemster, he proceeds over the trial of Kate's, but Kate won't speak for herself. It's not until Pete steps in and starts to speak for her, even though earlier she already made it clear to him that the baby that she had was not Pete's, and she left him after that. He says it's all a lie, but it's not until the trial that Kate's father starts connecting all the dots and realizes that Philip is the real father and that he's been lying to Pete. Philip, in complete disarray, steps down as being a deemster, and him and Kate join together along with the child, leaving Pete hopelessly alone and the town angry at them, believing they've committed an atrocity, and they walk away along the coastline. For the most part, it's a pretty depressing movie. In fact, there's a certain point, Kate is so sad that she has this expression the rest of the movie of just a complete empty soul. It's quite awful to watch, and honestly, even with the ending of the movie, I didn't really know exactly how to feel. It was by far Hitchcock's most downbeat ending so far. But at the same time, I almost have to admire it because it feels the most realistic. If something like this were to really happen in the real world, if that's what this story is trying to do, interpret the feelings of the human condition, I think this one succeeds the most of any Hitchcock film so far. Granted, I don't think it's on the same level as The Lodger or a lot of other Hitchcock films, but I do think he achieved something here that wouldn't have been possible in his earlier films. He was able to break down the characters to a very real level. 
it's a believable love triangle, and each of them has a good personality. Philip being a quiet, inconfident person, whereas Pete, who's very confident and very happy, very boisterous, uh, just the complete opposite of Philip in a way. And then you have Kate, who very much knows what she wants in life, but given what things were like at the time for women, she couldn't really do much about it. She couldn't really make her own decision. And Philip wasn't there to help her because he didn't want his own lie to be revealed. In the end, it's a bit of a happy ending because they end up together, but at what cost? They end up together, but they're not happy. Hitchcock has had a couple movies now where a woman shows up and will ruin a man's life. The women will screw people over quickly without a care in the world. I kind of expected that to happen with Kate as well. She is very one-dimensional at first. She was clearly in love with Philip and wouldn't explain the whole situation to Pete. And I felt, well, here we go. Pete's going to get screwed over. Kate's going to be the woman who tries to just get with Philip or anybody who has money and then will leave Philip and go for Pete once he has money. I thought it would go that direction just given what some of the other Hitchcock movies were like. But that's not exactly what happens. There's a very gradual progression between Kate and Philip's relationship. And as the movie goes on, you actually get to feel what her sadness is being stuck in this relationship that she wanted no part of. And as things go on, you feel bad for her in the situation she has been stuck in. She had someone she loved. She wanted to be with Philip. And there was nothing she could do about it. And rather than write this as some kind of perspective of the men getting screwed over, it's actually from the perspective of all of them. Everybody is losing something in this love triangle. Now, with all that being said, the movie still drags on a little longer than it should, even though there's a lot of great filmmaking technique in here. In fact, I thought that this was one of the best shot Hitchcock films so far. There's one specific shot that I really love, where Kate jumps into the water, attempting to commit suicide. We see her land in the water. There's, of course, the splash. And then we cut to a splash of a quill going into ink. And now we cut to the judge, who is writing up some legal paperwork, which immediately leads to the case against Kate for her attempted suicide. It's a wonderful transition. It's one of the most excellent transitions that Hitchcock accomplishes in his silent work. I'd be curious to watch that 83 minute version because perhaps it cuts out some of the scenes that drag on for too long. But then again, it's probably just a faster speed of the film reel itself. I did enjoy The Manx Man a lot. It would be a three out of five star movie. Now in the Truffaut book, Hitchcock and Truffaut don't really talk that much about The Manx Man but they talk about silent films in general before moving on into the sound work. Truffaut mentions that a lot of the work that directors were doing at the time was about as complex and as great as any of the silent work had ever been because they started to do more stuff with the camera. They started to move it around more. They started to do better compositions, better editing, better close-ups, and even doing things like not utilizing as many inner titles, really letting the visuals tell the story. Hitchcock felt the same way, but he also felt that sound films jeopardized the motion picture industry in general because everybody was so quick to add sound to films that people started to forget about the visual storytelling aspect of filmmaking. Which I think is a pretty repetitive thing to happen in the film industry. I feel the same way about films going from traditional 2D animation to computer 3D animation. I didn't feel that every single studio needed to transition to the computer, because even up until the last few popular years of traditional animation, people were doing crazy, amazing advancements to the art form. I can understand why Hitchcock feels that same way about silent movies. People were so practiced at the craft and advancing things so much that it makes you wonder, had sound never been introduced, how much farther they would have taken the art form at an earlier time. So I think that was a nice wrap up of the silent era. And now we move on to the sound era. Next week, we'll be talking about blackmail, which was released as a silent film as well. But I'll be focusing more on the sound version of the film. I have the Kino Blu-ray release and we will be discussing that next week. So thanks for joining me for the Manx Man. Let me know your thoughts on this movie. Let me know your thoughts on Hitchcock in general. And we'll see you next time. This concludes my part of the program. 
Next time, I shall return with another story.